the teaching substance. All Dhamma spoken by the Buddha have a teaching substance. What is the substance of this sutra's teaching? It consists of words, sentences, writings, and sound. Manju Sri Bodhisattva suggests to the Buddha that when the first common appears in the world, the true teaching substance of this region resides only in sound. The region meant is the Saha wound, our wound of suffering. However, sound alone cannot be considered the substance of the teaching. Wind and water also make sounds, but they cannot be called the substance of the teaching. More specifically, then the substance of the teaching consists of sound, words, sentences, and writings. The sound is that of the Buddha's first speaking this drama. Once it was spoken, sound became words, and the words formed sentences, which were then written down. Once it was written down, the teaching became available, so the sutra's teaching substance is composed of sound, words, sentences, and writings. The teaching substance can be divided into four doors. The first is the door of accompanying phenomena. In this case, the sound was sentences and writings. The Suragama's teaching substance is based also on the door of consciousness only and on the door of returning to the nature which is not concerned with appearances but returns directly to the nature. The sutra also takes the door of unobstructedness as its teaching substance. The door of consciousness only discusses how the three realms arise only from the mind and the myriad dramas only from consciousness. Shakyamuni Buddha contemplated the conditions to see which dramas he would use. He should use to rescue beings. Then, from within consciousness, he spoke the Dharma to teach and transform living beings, and their consciousness gained the benefit. This is a door of consciousness only, taking consciousness only as the substance of his teaching. The door of returning to the nature is completely interpenetrated without obstruction. In it, the consciousness disappears and returns to the nature. Returning to the nature is also the substance of the teaching. What is the door of non-obstruction? The former doors include both phenomena and noumena. With the door of returning to the nature being noumena, when the four doors combine phenomena and phenomena are non-obstructive. This non-obstruction, then the perfect fusion and unobstructedness of all phenomena and of phenomena comprises this sutra's teaching substance. Individuals are able to receive the teaching. This refers to the living beings who are taught and transformed, to whom is the teaching of this sutra directed. The Suragama Sutra causes sentient beings causes sentient and insentient creatures to perfect all wisdom at the same time. Both sentient and insentient beings can realize Buddhahood. Those who are taught specifically here are the sound hearers, once enlightened to conditions, and those with something left to learn. Sound hearers or hearts hear the Buddha's sound and awaken to the way they cultivate the Dharma door of the Four Truths. Suffering, accumulation, extinction, and the way. Once enlightened to conditions are Pratika Buddhas born at a time when there is a Buddha in the world, they cultivate the twelve wings of conditioned possession and awaken to the way. When there is no Buddha in the world, Pratika Buddhas are called solitary enlightened ones. Solitary enlightened ones live deep in the mountains in the remote valleys where they hide away in caves. There they watch the myriad things between heaven and earth continually live and die. In the spring, the hundred flowers open. In the autumn, the yellow leaves fall. Watching these changes, they awaken to the way. Besides teaching the sound hearers, 
and the ones in identical conditions. This sutra also teaches those with something left to learn, which in this case refers to the Bodhisattvas. The Buddha is the only one who has nothing left to learn. The sutra also transforms the fixed nature sound hearers, those who do not wish to turn from the small vehicle toward the great, a sound hearer, those whose nature is flexible turns from the small toward the great and can pass from the position of sound hearer through that of one enlightened to conditions on to become a bodhisattva. All those sound hearers, once enlightened to conditions, bodhisattvas and fixed nature sound hearers can be said to be the primary recipients of the sutra's teaching all living beings of the three realms, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm, are the primary recipients of the teaching. This will try, of course, with all opportunities and takes everyone across without exception. Similarities, differences, and determination of time. The principle is that which is held in honor. What the principle leads us back to is called its implication. The teaching of the two vehicles, sound hearers and practical Buddhas, is concerned primarily with the cause and effect. This is a provisional dharma. The dharma the Buddha spoke includes both provisional and actual teaching. The provisional is temporary, the actual is everlasting. With the provisional dharma causes principle, the entering is its implication. When true appearance is reached, the provisional becomes actual. When the actual is reached, one is said to have awakened and entered. Thus, the awakening is the principle. The entering is its implication. When Ananda, the protagonist of the sutra, ran, into trouble, the Buddha rescued him and then taught him to turn from the small toward the great. That is the principle. Ananda's arrival at the ultimate fruit is its implication. The principle and its implication thus penetrate to the Buddha way and other way to Buddhahood and are thus distinguished from the very small vehicle sutras which discuss only the small vehicle and cannot penetrate to the Buddha position. This refers to the time when the sutra was spoken. Spoken, The Buddha spoke Dharma for 49 years. When he spoke the Suragama Sutra, King Prasenayit was 62 years old, and since the Buddha and King Prasenayit were the same age, this would place the sutra in the Prana period. But if we judge the sutra by its teaching, it is classified as Vaibhulya. Vaibhulya, a Sanskrit word, means broadening passages and refers to the third period of Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching. According to Tiantai classification, therefore the previous classification of this sutra as a final teaching, according to Sian Shou classification, was correct. The history of the transmission and translation. After the great Tiantai Master Chu Yi read the Dharma Flow Sutra, he divided all sutras into three sections. The preface, the body which embodies the principle and implication of the sutra, and the propagation, which is an exhortation at the end of the sutra, that it is circulated throughout the world. Later, when an Indian Dharma master came to China and learned that great master Chu Yu had divided all sutras into these three parts, he was amazed and exclaimed, that is just the same way the sutras of India are divided. The Suragama Sutra, for instance, is divided in exactly the same way. When Master Chu Yu heard of the existence of the Suragama Sutra, which he had never seen, he was moved to bow to the West in the hope that he would one day see the Sutra. He bowed to the West every day for 18 years, 
but in the end he never had the opportunity to see the sutra how superior must be the causes and conditions that allow us who have never bowed to the sutra to be able to encounter it now to read it and to recite it eventually the king of india proclaimed the Surakama Sutra, a national treasure because it was one of the sutras that Nagarjuna Bodhisattva brought back from the Dragon Palace. After the proclamation, no one was permitted to take the sutra out of the country. At that time, Dharmaster Brahmiti was intent upon getting the sutra out of India into other countries, especially China. He set out for China carrying a copy of the sutra, only to be stopped at the border by customs officials who would not permit him to carry the sutra across the border. Since he was unable to take the sutra out of the country, he returned and tried to think of a way to get the sutra out of the country. Finally, he thought of a way. He wrote out the sutra in minute characters on extremely fine silk, wrote it up and sealed it with wax. Then he cut open his arm and placed the small scroll inside his flesh. Next, he applied medicines to the wound and waited it to heal. Some people say he put the sutra in his bed, but I think that since it would not have been respectful to place the text below the waist, he probably chose some fleshy place on the upper part of his body and put the sutra there. When he the wound healed, he again set out for China and passed through the border guards without incident since the sutra was well concealed. Eventually, he arrived in Canton province where he happened to meet the Prime Minister Fang Yung who invited him to recite at a temple in Canton, Canton while he translated the sutra. Those were, these were the difficulties encountered at the time the sutra was translated. How fortunate for us that the Dharma master was so determined to take the sutra to China. From this account, you can see how often how important this sutra is. The translator, Sutra, translated during the Tang Dynasty by Shramana Paramiti from Central India. Commentary It was during the Tang Dynasty after Impressor Wu Tai Tian retired in the first year of the Shanglong reign period that Shramana Paramiti translated the Sutra from Sanskrit to Chinese. He accomplished the translation very quickly so that he could get back to India before the customs officials at the border were punished for letting him sleep through with the sutra. Dharma Master Paramiti wanted to return to India and turn himself in so the Gasa would not be punished. After he finished his translation, he went back to India, confessed to the king and asked to receive whatever punishment the offense entailed. This Dharma Master's merit with regard to this sutra is extremely great since it is due to his efforts at the, the outset that we now have the opportunity to investigate this sutra. We should first be thankful for this Shramana's meritorious work. Shramana is a Sanskrit word which means diligent and putting to rest, that is, diligently cultivating precepts, samadhi and wisdom, and putting to rest greed, hatred and stupidity. The Buddha is also called a Shramana. Once in India, when the Buddha was in the world, the Bhishu Ashvayid, master of horses, was walking down the road carefully attired in his robes, his awesome deportment was so striking that upon seeing him, Maud Galayana was moved to say, You are so majestic, you are also manner so well perfected, that certainly you must have a master. Whom do you study with? 
Bishu Yasha Vayid said, All dharmas arise from conditions. All dharmas cease because of conditions. The Buddha, the great Shramana, spoke, often spoke of this. When Maudgalayana heard those words, he accompanied the monk back to the Jetan Grove in the garden of Anasapindaka, bound to the Buddha as his master and led the home life. Each of us should study the conduct of a Shramana. In order to cultivate precepts, samadhi and wisdom diligently, like the Shramana, we would first take refuge with the Triple Jewel and then receive the five precepts to refrain from killing, from stealing, from sexual misconduct, from lying, and from taking intoxicants. After receiving these precepts, we should actually put them into practice, which means we should never violate them. The five precepts are extremely important. Strict adherence to them will ensure rebirth in the realm of humans. If you cultivate the five precepts, you won't lose the opportunity to be born a person. Someone may say, however, I understand why one should not kill. After all, all living beings have the Buddha nature. All can become Buddhas, so every living being's life should be spared. I also understand why stealing is not good and that it is important to refrain from indulging in sexual misconduct and lying. But why are intoxicants included within the five precepts? I've always enjoyed drinking and smoking. Everybody drinks. Everybody smokes. What's wrong with it? In fact, I'm seriously considering dropping my study of the Buddha drama just because of this prohibition against intoxicants. You should stop and think about it instead of just following the crowd. Others enjoy smoking and so you enjoy them. Others enjoy drinking and so you drink too. You get caught up in such company and do the things they do until eventually you get the habit as well. Most people don't have great phones but rather just slight phones and, and little problems. But just on account of these slight problems, you would consider cutting short your study of the Buddha Dharma. How stupid that would be? How stupid that would be? Do you want to know why there is a prohibition against wine? I'll tell you a true story to clarify this point. There was once a man who liked to drink. He took the five precepts, but afterwards he didn't keep them. How did this happen? One day he thought, perhaps I'll have a little drink of wine. He took out a bottle and had a few swallows. He was ac accused, accustomed, accustomed to, have, to having something to eat with his drink. So he set the bottle down and went outside to look for something to eat. He noticed that his neighbor's chicken had strayed over into his yard. Good, he thought it will make a good tracer, and he snatched up the pullet. At that point, he broke the precept against stealing. Once he'd stolen it, he had to kill it before he could eat it, and so he broke the precept against killing. Once the chicken was cooked, he used it to trace down his wine, and soon he was roaring drunk thus breaking once again the precept against the use of intoxicants. About that time, there was a knock at his door. It was the neighbor woman in search of a chicken. I haven't seen it, he blurted out, thereby breaking the precept against lying. A second glance at the neighbor woman revealed her beauty to him, and aroused by an overwhelming sexual desire, he raped her. Afterwards, he was sued. Now all this came about because he wanted to drink. Just because he had a few drinks, he subsequently broke the other four precepts and got into a lot of trouble. Intoxicants cause one to become confused and scattered, and so they are the object of one of the Buddhist prohibitions. A person who is drunk lacks self-control with no forewarning 
he can find himself suddenly in the heavens, suddenly on earth. He mounts the clouds and drives the fog. He'll do anything because it causes one to lose all inhibitions. It is included among the five precepts. If you receive the five precepts and do not violate them, then you are protected by good Dharma protecting spirits who are connected with each precept. If you break the precepts, the good spirits leave and no longer protect you. This is why receiving the precepts is extremely important in Buddhism. How does one receive the precepts? Someone may want to know. Merely reading in a book that one must not kill, steal, commit acts of sexual misconduct, lie, or take intoxicants does not count as taking precepts. Nor is it possible to go before the Buddhas, light some incense, and make some incense burns on your body and receive the precepts in that way. No, it is not done that way. If a lay person wishes to receive the five precepts, he must certainly find a high Sangha member of great virtue to certify that he, the Sangha member, has transmitted the substance of the precepts to the lay person. The Sangha member tells the lay person that from now on he or she is one who has received the precepts. The merit gained by receiving and maintaining, maintaining the precepts is inconceivably great and wonderful. But in order for it to be in accord with the Dharma, one must go before a Sangha member to seek and receive the precepts. In addition to cultivating the precepts, the Shramana cultivates Samadhi. There are many kinds of Samadhi that could be discussed, but in general, if you are not moved by any external experience, you are in Samadhi. How can one obtain Samadhi? First, you must become, become quiet by sitting in meditation and investigating dhyana. The reason why most people go restlessly back and forth each today and west tomorrow is that they have no samadhi. In the morning to the gate of Chin, in the evening to the court of Chu, they run all over because they don't have any samadhi. To obtain samadhi, you must work hard, and as you do, you may have many different experiences. But in the midst of these experiences, you should take care not to let them turn you around. That is samadhi. If an experience changes your state of mind, you have no samadhi. For instance, if you receive a letter containing bad news and it makes you worry, you have no samadhi, you don't pass the test. Or if you encounter some happy situation and you go chasing after it, you have no samadhi. If you are faced with a displeasing experience and you get angry, you also have no samadhi. You should be neither happy nor sad, neither exhilarated nor mournful. You have to have samadhi is to do things without getting emotional, but to use your way mind instead. By cultivating samadhi, you can open your wisdom. If you have no samadhi power, then you have no wisdom power. Without the strength of wisdom, how can you study and practice the Buddha Dharma? Where do samadhi power and wisdom power come from, you ask? They come from precepts. Every day you must protect and keep the precepts until even truly there comes to be a mutual response between the Dharma and your cultivation of it. When you have established this kind of relationship with the Dharma, you can obtain the nourishment of Dharma water. A Shramanara diligently cultivates precepts, samadhi and wisdom, and puts to rest greed, anger, and stupidity. These three poisons, greed, anger, and stupidity, are precisely the reason you have not realized Buddhahood. If you can put a stop to the three poisons, you will quickly become Buddhas.